every single thing you can see or touch at one point was impossible. If you say that's impossible, then you are saying that you are the only human to encounter and discover that which will remain impossible forever. Wait a second, why don't we figure out to hack a Stephen Hawking machine? Then we woke up one day and it became Time Magazine's top 50 inventions. Let it all hang out. Be positive, be optimistic. And also, if it's a shitty idea, Mark, that's a shitty idea. It's so refreshing to be in this room, to be talking about things that are gonna solve massive problems in an unencumbered, apolitical, as pure as possible way. I think why I love what I do right now is that everybody who jumps in our sandbox is doing it because they want to help somebody. What I can't figure out is uh, how the hell does, like, like everyone knows that a long time ago there were philosophers. And if you go to Twitter and someone has in their bio, I'm a philosopher, you're like, come on, philosophers were a long time ago. Uh, it seems to me like you're an inventor. But when I think of inventors, I think of like the light bulb and Thomas Edison and all this stuff. How, how do you become you? <laughs> uh, well, oh, that in the bio is not true. My mom wrote that. So I can't take responsibility <laughs> for it. So, well, uh, I guess she's in charge of your PR, right? Yeah, she's a good, she's a gas man. She gasses me up all the time. Um, I mean, Look, I think that life at the end of the day is about constantly placing yourself in the direction or in the path of things to happen. And um, I started off in production, uh, which was a total accident. Like my life has been a series of like sliding doors and accidents that I, I just chose to step through. Um, I moved back, I, moved, I got married really young, uh, moved to Europe with no passport or with no visa, with no plan, with $1,300 to my name. And my wife and I's pact was that we had paid off all of our bills before we got married and we were not going to use our credit cards. 60 days in, we were down to one meal a day. We had both lost about 15 pounds and we didn't have 15 pounds to give. And we just scrambled and kind of made things happen and ended up giving this. Hold on. That sounds like the opposite of the freshman 15. <laughs> yeah, it was more like you know, 15 is actually being a little bit conservative. So it didn't seem too ridiculous. But we, we, were, we would go to... Um, tea houses in the south of Portugal and just drink tea because they would serve biscuits and things like that. And so that's, we would get like free food that way. And we would pretend we had a couple of, we had each had one nice outfit that we wore over and over again to kind of make it seem like we deserved to be there. And we would just keep getting new hot water until they were onto us and they would shoo us off. So, um, so we, when we came back, we ended up, um, I, we crashed with a friend of ours who was, uh, in just started working on this new program called After Effects that was animating things. And I ended up asking him, I woke up one day when he was kind of clicking around. I'm like, what are you doing? He said, oh, I, I'm animating stuff. I'm like, oh, how do you get work? He said, I wait for the phone to ring. And I'm like, well, that's a stupid business model. And he said, what would you do? I said, I would make the phone ring. So we were supposed to surf that day. So he said, all right, here's the deal. Uh, heads, we go surfing. Tails, there's this conference I heard about in Las Vegas. And we can just put you on a Southwest flight and you can go over there and see if you can dig up business. So flip the coin, landed his hand and it was heads, go surfing. And we stared at it for a second and I reached out and flipped it over to tails and i'm like i'm going to Vegas. Ah, there you go you do the right thing to do hold on Before, so so i feel like we're going to keep seeing the same pattern throughout but um were you just are you just like addicted to like let's see what happens or are you super comfortable with risk uh or like most people won't just go to europe without any money most wives won't tag along without any money most people won't say hey can you teach me how to keyframe in After Effects so I can learn how to somehow become an animator and then just jump on a flight and go do this stuff? So like, it seems already innate to you that you were already doing, you're like, you're, you were willing to like, just jump in on things. Yeah. Well, I mean, my wife's a badass. So she's all, she's like, she's right there, you know, neck and neck, arm and arm with me. Um, yeah, I guess so. You know, I kind of, my, my opinion on life is kind of like, why the fuck not? Right? Like what's the worst that can happen? Someone says no, or you, you know, you skin your knee and, you know, 
skin, you know, flesh replaces itself eventually. So bones heal, like you might as well go for it. So yeah, I guess, I mean, I'm not trying to be flippant about it, but I kind of think of like, why not try stuff? And so that's been kind of the story of my life is just trying stuff. Cause that led to launching an animation company, which led to me being in production, which led to me doing all these things. And then that led to me realizing or having this chance encounter with a with a paralyzed graffiti artist who I said, all right, we're going to try to make him a way for him, like make a way for him to draw again, using his only his eyes that worked one time magazines, top 50 inventions. And we were like, no oh, shit, I guess we're good at this. And so we kept going and we kept going and we kept going. And now I'm talking to you on a podcast today. <laughs> and, and this is the pinnacle of your career. So, yeah, so congratulations. Yeah, this is it. Exactly. <laughs> And so anyone who does know your story, um, you know, maybe they've seen your TED Talks or some of the other things that have been featured. Um, you seem to have built uh, the last 10 years or so this um, innovation fund, this uh, nonprofit, this ability with Not Impossible to be able to say like, hey, I see something wrong in the world and I want to go out there and fix it. I'm going to bring everyone to my house. Um, I'm going to bring a bunch of smart people. You know, they're going to crash in my place and we're going to try and figure this out. Uh, and it seems to work. Now, I only get to hear the stories that work. Uh, I only get to hear about the in innovations that work, uh, you know, and so on. But um, tell us about how you fell into that process, how you fell into like almost this very strange incubator, innovation, R&D, nonprofit type model. It's really weird. Uh, I take that as a compliment. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> uh, well, I had everything planned out from the very get-go. I do not believe that yeah, at all, man. Not at all. Not at all. Um, you know, <clears throat> the eye writer, the thing that we made for the paralyzed graffiti artist, that was this little, you know, this is interesting. This is this, we created this thing and it went bigger than anything I'd ever worked on in my life. And I was, I'm from LA and I'm in production. So I know how to do, like, I know how now, to take a project now, that we've now done. The story, the story with this, like connecting with this artist, you're at um, what you're at, like an art gallery or something, right? Like you're out in the world doing your, your artistic thing, getting inspired no, and loving stuff. No, now. not at all. I got invited <laughs> to a gallery of a fundraising event. My wife and I went on a date. It's far less, it's far less dramatic. Or I pictured you like, I pictured you like, you know, like you're walking, like, you know how you hear stories of Andy Warhol, like just hanging out with like the coolest people and having all his art. Like, that's how I imagine you. Is that no, you or no? It was all. that except for, I wasn't one of the cool people. <laughs> and to correct you for what you said before, I wasn't doing any animation. I was the gas man. I was the sales guy. I was out there like bringing in business. I was the executive producer. And so okay. we showed up at this gallery event just to, you know, it was date night. That's why we were there. There was no master strategy, but then we went in and we looked around and we're like, this is amazing. The energy in the room was palpable. People were hugging and high-fiving, like not what you typically see at a gallery event when you have a bunch of adults looking at art, when kind of looking and pondering and making little comments and drinking lukewarm Chardonnay. Like that's, that was what you would expect and that's not what we got. And so when we re like we kind of walked around and came back and said to my buddy who brought me there, I was like, dude, I want to meet the artist. And he said, you can't meet the artist the artist has ALS. He has Lou Gehrig's disease and this is a fundraiser. And so we went, Oh, and so that we ended up meeting his family and friend and we're still, you know, tight with them all today. You know, they're, and that was this chance encounter that kind of stuck in the back of my head. And then, you know, to make a long story a little bit shorter, we ended up deciding, as you know, in the business of production, what do you do with the holidays? You go to your ad agencies or your brands or your movie studios and you give them something. You give them a $100 bottle of wine, a $150 bottle of scotch. And why? Because you now expect that since you gave them a $100 bottle of wine, they're supposed to give you millions of dollars of business. And so <laughs> we were like, my wife said, this is bullshit. Let's actually do something more meaningful. So we ended up doing it's the taking that money that we would have spent and we uh, made a donation to the tempt one foundation the artist and when we met with his brother and father at breakfast to give him the check and i asked them what they were going to use the money for they said they just wanted to talk to their brother they just wanted to talk to their son again and to me that was baffling because 
I thought that everybody had a Stephen Hawking machine and they quickly corrected me and said, no, that's if you've got money or insurance. And so I was like, well, that's ridiculous. Let's change that. And so I said, let's get you a Stephen Hawking machine. They got all fired up. I kind of got caught up in the moment and I got this stupid harebrained idea of like, well, wait a second. Why don't we figure out to hack a Stephen Hawking machine and make it so that instead of just the robot talking, let's figure out how he can draw using only his eyes. And that's what we did. And I'm way oversimplifying this because it was super hard. And I was, it was like not, two years, wasn't it? <laughs> it took a long time. And it was not me doing the programming. I was doing the, like the convening because that's essentially what I do is I convene people. So we convened all these brilliant minds at our house. They from all over the world. And we hacked and programmed and ate and drank a lot of carbohydrates for weeks and weeks. And then eventually, you know, taught, you know, went to the, and and temp, we went to the hospital and temp drew again, using only his eyes. And that was this moment where everybody, like everybody kind of came in. If you come from advertising, you have this little bit of edge to you, this little skepticism, you know, of like, ah, it's been done before. That's Mm -hmm. not cool. Or someone else is cooler. There's this, this kind of like adult, like, I don't know, just, bitchiness, I would say, right? That exists in it. And all of a sudden there was just this injection of potential and possibility and just, I don't know, feeling like, wow, the world is an amazing place. And by using all the skills that we have, we helped make it better for this one person. And there was no agenda. We weren't selling anything. We weren't doing it for any reason. We weren't promoting it. There was just, we just wanted to help this one dude. And then we all went back to our day jobs. You've hit on something. You've hit on something so, so key. When I was learning more and more about you and getting into your story and and hearing everything, one of the notes I gave myself was, it's like, wow, this guy seems, um, not every day, right? But there doesn't, there seems to be an optimism. There seems to be a hope. There's not the normal cynicism. There's not the normal uh, skepticism that, you know, in, in a lot of the stories you're telling and a lot of the work you're doing, and it's really inspiring and it's interesting. And when you just mentioned, you know, in the ad world, in the agency world, in the creative world, there's always this like, um, I don't know how to, for those who aren't in our world, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, you want to be cool, but you don't want to be seen being cool or trying you to be cool. You, you, want you can't to- be eager. If you're eager, no, no, you can't try. And can't God try forbid, if I'm like, oh, Mark, that's an amazing idea. You'd be like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, let's consider that. You're like, no, just let it all hang out. Like, be positive, be optimistic. And also, if it's a shitty idea, Mark, that's a shitty idea. Like, let's imagine. Like, be objective I, about it. It's not a big uh, deal. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I actually always say that this probably, I'm probably breaking some kind of politically correct rule by saying this, but I love hanging out with people who are on the spectrum. And I work with a lot of people on the spectrum because they're geniuses, right? And they say, like, when you say, like, if they walk in, they're like, I don't like your shirt. Do you know what that means? It means they don't like your shirt. Stop. It's not a judgment on you or who you are as a person or whatever. So when you say, I don't want to pursue it that way, let's figure out another idea. They say, I don't agree with you. And then we argue and then we decide (laughs) and then we move forward. Or they say, okay, what else would you like to do? But it's almost this, and I'm saying it kind of robotically, but it's so refreshing to just like kick that emotion shit to the curb and be emotional about why you want to do it, but not having this, this kind of contingency of ego connected to what you do. And that's, I think, why I love what I do right now is that everybody who jumps in our sandbox is doing it because they want to help somebody. They're not doing yeah. it for the press. They're not doing yeah. it for the PR. Are. They're not, they're doing it for that feeling of like, wow, I can use my skills and my talents to actually help someone. So in the ad space, we just did this massive convening. The people in that room, I was like, oh my God, these people are brilliant. And their feeling was, it's so refreshing to be in this room, to be talking about things that are going to solve massive problems. 
as opposed to like what I do on the day to day and I'm trying to hawk or sell or move a product or a good or service. And then I've got someone who essentially has power over me telling me that's not right. Make the logo bigger, come up with a different thing. And that's all gone. And now we can just be like, what's the best way to solve this problem? And it's just, I don't know. That's why I'm so fired up on doing what I do because it's just this, it's this creative extension or it's this ability to realize the creative process in an unencumbered, apolitical, as pure as possible way. There's sometimes, I mean, look, it's not always perfect, but it's as pure of an expression of just wanting to create as anything that I've ever experienced. That is such a, a, a beautiful way to look at it. And the cynicism that exists, especially in advertising and marketing, um, because at, deep down inside, we know that we're pouring our energy, our heart and soul into things that will age out very quickly, that um, we'll live in a campaign that we never quite could have done the way we wanted to do it. Um, and on top of that, uh, frankly, it's always just a means to an end, right? Like, like we were spending a lot of time creating stuff just to make things so that way someone else can make things. And um, and so... I was going to ask whether the optimism was real, you know, that's, whether the, all of that stuff's real, but I can hear it right in your voice, right? All of the stuff of the business world, you're like, that's all cool. <laughs> but here we're actually helping people. Now, and now but um, hang on. here's the deal. It, I want to just make sure that this is not some like retouched Instagram photo, right? Shit's yeah, yeah let's get real. Shit's hard. It's difficult. And the hardest thing... So there's an amazing creative who I met. So um, if you see back there, because I, I felt a little like, you know, I figured like I need to drive a bigger truck than you. So we put a bunch of metals on our wall too, because you've got so many on your wall. <laughs> so for my listeners in my background, if you go to YouTube, you can see that I have a few uh, awards. A few. And... It's in the teens. <laughs> it's not a few. It's the teens. There's, well, there's... Hold on. Does this make oh. me sound like an asshole? Because I have so many that I actually have some on my floor. That's good. Um, that's good. <laughs> So, so I just, I literally have them on the, uh, Oh yeah. Oh, hang on. Hang on. We're going to call time out on this. I'm going to go collect all of our, we're going to have a, we're going to have a metal off right now. No, but here's the point. So we went the, after the I rider went huge. Right. And we're like, Oh, this is pretty cool. It, and, and the end of that story was we all went back to our day jobs and felt alive and amazing. And then we woke up one day and it became Time Magazine's top 50 inventions. And we went, what the hell just happened? There was no press, there was no PR, there was no nothing. And if you're in the creative industry, we're used to like, hey, I just finished this amazing Chef Boyardee commercial, you should check it out. you know. And we're not doing any of that shit. This thing goes bigger than anything we could have ever imagined. And so it made me think like, wow, maybe this is what I should be doing, using technology to help people. And so I thought about it and was like, couldn't stop thinking about it and was having this kind of not a, it was not a midlife crisis because I was loving what I was doing, but I was like, maybe this is what I should do. And then I finally, as a producer, a good producer, I was like, all right, this day, this time, making the decision, made the decision. The decision was this. You got so lucky. That was so <laughs> lucky. Like, dude, you stepped in, you stepped in beautiful shit. Enjoy it. <laughs> Enjoy your Andy Warhol 15 minutes of fame, but you got lucky, right? Yeah, you're 15 minutes, man. You did it. Good job. Yeah, but then that was our whole plan. And then we woke up and it was Time Magazine's top 50 inventions and, and TED Talks and all this stuff that happened. Things that I always aspired or like didn't even think I would ever achieve. But now it just started happening to me. And I was like, okay, this is crazy. This is nuts. And I basically said, all right, I'm not going to do it. I got lucky and I made the decision. I felt good with it, opened up the computer and I had an email from the artist and the email said, that was the first time I'd drawn anything for seven years. I feel like I've been held underwater and someone finally reached down and pulled my head up so I could take a breath. And I was like, all right, we got to do this thing now. And that was kind of the decision to, to go about starting this process, right? How was that? We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have a pathway to do it. And then that, but we were like, let's go. G Geronimo jumping in, jumped out of the airplane without a parachute. And like, here we go. Fast forward. 
and this is going to be a super condensed version, we end up tackling this initiative called Project Daniel is what it's called. And we ended up creating the world's first 3D printing prosthetic lab in a war-torn region of the world called the Nuba Mountains. We went to a refugee camp and we 3D printed an arm for a young boy who had both of his arms blown off. His name is Daniel. And he was able to feed himself for the first time in two years. And then we taught the villagers how they might be able to 3D print arms after we left. We're like, now we had, we, uh, this is after the iRider, right? So we're like, all right, we're going to actually film this time. We're going to actually make sure that we can capture this story. Fast forward, we ended up winning. We ended up cleaning up in Cannes. We won the titanium. We won gold. We won multiple gold, silver, like all these different things. And this woman came up to me. And this is kind of, a, this is a full of the story. This woman who is a friend and advisor, her name is Susan Creedle. She's like the universal global galaxial creative director for FCB right now. She's a total badass. <laughs> and we're standing in afterwards and we're all, everyone's drunk and partying afterwards and everyone's, all the winners are carrying their lions around. And I never thought I would have that. So I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. And she walks up in this very serious voice and she's like, congratulations, Mick. And I said, thank you, Susan. Thank you. She goes, just know that from this point forward, Every decision you make is going to be, you're going to be jeopardizing the purity of what you just created. And I was like, whoop, I'm instantly sobered up. She's like, now you're the bell of the ball and people are going to want what you have and what you just accomplished and they're going to want to replicate it. But what you did was so pure. She's like, protect that with your life, right? So this goes back to what we were just talking about. And I've never forgotten that. Clearly, you can see how I remember exactly. I, re I can feel the moment that I was there when she told me this. Back to the part where I said, this shit's hard. Every day you get challenged and we get challenged with modifying or, or just kind of skewing or aborting the vision that we have for what we do so that fill in the blank so that we can make payroll so that we can, whatever it might be. It's usually monetary. Usually you get challenged with that because when the shit gets hard, you're willing to give up on your values or your ethics or your things like that. And I'm not saying you're not going to go kill people, but that ideal that you had, you can change a little bit. That's when it's hard. And I have to say the thing that I think we've been really, Really good at, not perfect, but really good at is staying true to why we exist. And why we exist is to create technology for the sake of humanity and to tell the story of that. And we've figured out how to monetize it along the way, but why people continue to come back, I think, and we've had people go away and say, hell no, if you're not willing to play by our rules, we're not going to play with you. And we each take our toys and go away. But the reason people come back and the pe reason people come to us is at the end of the day, people want people who A, have an opinion, B, who are passionate and C, are absolutely just committed to the way to their values and to the, their, the how they see the world because positions and opinions right now are changed and are so fluid and you can take this side one day and take that side when someone has a point of view and they stick with that point of view and they're militant about that point of view regardless of the ramifications that, that might have eventually that becomes this magnet for people wanting to either work with you pay you collaborate with you whatever and and you at the end of the day can look at yourself in the mirror, sometimes a little skinnier because you haven't been able to feed yourself, but you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, all right, I'm at least, you know, Shakespeare to thine own self be true. You know, one of my, um, one of my favorite nonprofits is Charity Water. And, you know, they went out Scott, to the world Scott with Harris, this. Scott Harrison is, I would call him a friend. When I launched my book, I had him read a section of my book. And this is years ago. That guy is a total badass. He is. A badass. And his own story is bananas, you know, in terms of growing up in a household uh, with a mother who was tremendously ill. Um, you know, becoming a club promoter in New York and flying all over the world and waking up one day on New Year's Day overlooking like the mountains or something and realizing, what am I doing with my life? But what I've learned from them was they had this mission of like, okay, we're going to set up a charity where every single dollar that that someone donates, if, if a 12-year-old girl is going to donate her birthday $12 for turning 12, I want to 
assure her that every dollar is going there as opposed to in most charities and nonprofits, 20, 25% goes to operating, you know, for every dollar someone donates, 25 cents is going to running the charity. And then they had this great principle. We're going to run two charities, right? Like every dollar is going to go to water, but that means that we need actually a second charity just to cover our operating expenses. And it's super principled. It's super great. And yet I've heard him and his other partners kind of declare like, gosh, I wish we didn't go down that route. <laughs> like what a pain in the ass it is to be so principled all the time. And so I wonder now should, that you're it should, known- it should be, you know, it should be called clarity water, not charity water, <laughs> because you know, with perfect clarity, what you're donating to. You know, I like it, that. It gives you an idea. You know what you, when you walk in, you know what you're you know what you're about to be served at that restaurant. Hold on. So so Scott's one of your friends, you'd say? I mean, we haven't talked for a minute, but I, I'm a I'm definitely a fanboy and I yeah, I can give him a call. He'll, I, in Los Angeles, everyone claims to be friends with everybody. If I called him, he'd take my call. But I, ha- I don't like I don't go to his house for Christmas or his kids' birthday parties. I'm totally cool with that level of friendship. Uh, if you called him, he would take your call. That says enough. Uh, what have you learned from him? I just said clarity. Like the just end the of the clarity, day, yeah. people want clarity. P- people want to know what they signed up for. And you as a person have to be prepared, especially as a creative, you have to be prepared for people not agreeing with it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Now let's be super clear. If you're an artist and you're making your art, I don't believe you should make your art to fulfill what the market wants. You should be true to yourself. If you're a commercial artist, if you're a copywriter, if you're an art director, if you're a producer working in an ad agency or things like that, you have a job to do that. And that's when I think the nuance of trying to stay true to being opinionated and protecting your what you think will work and what you think is best and having to work with clients who eventually have that ability to say no, make the logo bigger. That's a tough, it's a tough place to be. So I really want to make sure if you're listening right now, <clears throat> I'm not asking for you to think that you can overthrow everything. Uh, I, you know, you show up and you're like, I won't make the logo bigger. Go f- yourself, right? Like that's, but if you can always have this point in yourself of where you think, if you're protecting what you think is best, you're arguing for it, you're defending it. That point of view is what people love. It's what you love to hire as an employer. It's what you'd like to work with as a collaborator. And ultimately, what why people will keep coming back is for that point. So look at the best creatives. Look at someone like Saul Bass. Look, I just, I'm halfway through watching the Steven Spielberg uh, documentary on HBO. And that dude, like the studio told him in duel when the truck went over uh, the edge and it was a, you know, amazing film. They're like, we want the truck to blow up and you didn't have it blow up. So we want to redo it and have it blow up. And he was like, no, no. Now this was, this is not Steven Spielberg. Now this is Steven yeah, Spielberg. Yeah. Like, I think it was his first. It was, it yeah. It was a made for TV, made for TV film. Right. Yeah. And they, yeah, it was his first thing. Yeah. So there is something that people ultimately will fight. Like if you think people are just, if they want you to do something and you say, no, they're like, okay, well, he's opinionated. I'm going to walk away now. No, people are going to fight. There's tension there, but how you defend that and how you protect your point of view as a creative and creative doesn't just mean you can draw or write also as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, it's really important to defend what you think is important. There needs to be barriers and lines that you feel like you can cross. And there needs to be lines that you feel like you can't cross. Right. So I look, I I need to self admit right now that I'm a fountainhead. I'm a Howard Rourke guy, you know, and he's an extremist in terms of that, but that type of allegiance and passion around what you think is right is so inspiring to other people. I have three uh, thoughts, questions, lessons that I want to try and play like bat around with you from the story that you just shared um, of working through everything. So first, you talked about how you figured out how to, a way to monetize kind of this system, this process, going from iWriter to the to you know the Dan project with the arm, the prosthetic arm, and everything you're doing. So so. You know, if we break down, for example, the Dan Project, my understanding Daniel, is that Daniel Project, the Daniel Project, Project sorry, my understanding, Project, Project Daniel, Project Daniel, my understanding is that 
um, with Project Daniel, you know, made, were made aware of this boy in Sudan who had lost his arms because of military coups that were going on, dropping bombs everywhere. That um, you were, you kind of, it was on your heart. It was imprinted on you that like it's terrible that this thing happened to this young boy named Daniel, who is now a burden to his family, who wished that he could die so he would no longer be a burden to his family. <laughs> And you were like, maybe we can do something about this. But here's the question I have. In trying to solve this problem of making a cost-effective prosthetic for someone in a war-torn uh, country that is completely remote, you are bringing people to your house. You're figuring things out. You're making mistakes left, right, and center. You're flying to South Africa. You're learning about how to do uh, 3D printing. You're setting up stuff in Sudan. Like, like, at the end of the day, someone has to pay for this stuff. How do you finance all of these, because it's super inspiring and it's super cool and people might be volunteering their time, but things still cost money. How do you finance this stuff? Um, so part of the experience that I had coming from the advertising world is that I realized that one, the crazy ass budgets that it brands have when it comes to production and also media buys and just that whole world of marketing and advertising. And so what we figured out how to do was because by the way, that project Daniel project, right at the, as we were kind of getting to the point where we we're planning our trip to go over, we realized we were out of money and I was like, Oh shit, we got to figure this out. So we ended up going back to my Rolodex of people that I kind of knew in advertising. And we ended up talking to this little company called Intel, told them about what we were doing. <laughs> they said, you may have heard, you may have heard of that little, um, some weird little tech company that makes chips. Yeah. right? <laughs> and so what we ended up doing was we said, all right, well, Hey, this is what we're doing. We're going to go over, we're going to start the world's first 3d printing prosthetic lab. We've got this theory and this approach and we're going to do it. And it'd be amazing if you could help us finance it. And we always joke that they kind of reached into the cushions and grabbed some loose change. And we're like, here you go. And that more than financed what we were doing. And project Daniel ended up winning every award under the sun. Intel won more awards that year for this little tiny project that they did with not impossible, this unknown innovation studio than any of their massive campaigns that they were, that we're talking, their budget start with a B, not a million that starts with a billion. And they won more awards with our project than any of the things that they had worked on in other places. And that was this moment of like, okay, when you can find the right fit with the right brand and have the right rules established of like, we're not going to bastardize or proselytize the, who we are to, um, and jeopardize who we are and what we stand for and how we think, because you tell us to, we flipped it around and said, we're going to be who we are. We're going to be who, what we do. And we think you would be an incredible partner in this. And that model, which by the way, was scary as shit, right? It was scary as shit. I had only known that when I put my hand over the fire, it was going to burn or get smacked, right? Like, uh, because, and that's what I've been grown up doing in, in advertising. You tell someone, no, you're not going to make the logo bigger. Bam, you get your hand slapped. We were like, we're changing all things saying, listen, this is the way, it, if you want to work with us, this is how it's going to be. And people went, okay, you know, and what has changed now is that when we work with people, we collaborate with them and we ask them, what are your, our partners, you know, our brands or corporations that, that work with us. We don't ask them their opinion because we have to, we ask our, their opinion because we want to, and they might say, make the logo bigger. And we're like, that's actually a good idea. Let's do it. But the mm. power has shifted to trying to do what's best as opposed to doing what you have to do. And that I feel like I lucked out in terms of creating a scenario that everybody subscribes to now. And now we get amazing work that comes out of it because everybody is like, we just want to make this thing better. And when people want to make that logo bigger, I keep beating that one to death. But then we say like, well, why? And what's the rationale? And we can argue with it, but we're not in a position where we have to do that. And so the narrative around what we do is not hawking or pushing or selling. It's about how do you tell a story of real people trying to make a difference in the world. And our point is, I want to tell that story so that when Mark sees it, when Elena sees it, when Sergio sees it, when whoever sees it, they see it and they can see themselves in that story and say, dude, if that loud, dumb, bald, white guy from Venice Beach can do it, I can do that too. 
And they, that's how we start to propagate, start to create exponential change. Like that's the entire purpose. And if you party with us, if you want to work with us, you got to sign up for that. And now a decade later, we're a decade old now, we don't have to justify that anymore. It was way harder at the beginning. Now that's kind of the rules of engagement. You know, if you sign up, that's what you're, that's what you're a game for. Yeah. Yeah. So for anyone who's facing that where, you know, I was working with um, a prospect yesterday through strategy. And this morning I was on a call with my COO and I was just like, I just, I don't know how to tell them that they were shopping us. They were trying to qualify us. And I don't know how to tell them without offending them that, um, they're, that I can't work with them because of our reasons, because of our values. Do you know what I mean? And so, so it's hard. It's a challenge to be so principled all the time. Um, but I, I have to ask now. Hold on. Made a- on time out. The answer to that question is, if it smells like shit, it probably is, right? If there's smoke, there's fire. And if there's something in you that says something doesn't feel right about this, then in my opinion... Yeah. Right? This is free advice. So you get what you pay for. In my I, opinion, I, I, please. you walk, but you let all the people that work with you know this is why you're walking and how you struggled with making this decision, but you feel like this is the best decision for the company, even though it takes money out of the PL, it takes money out of, you know, people's Christmas bonuses might be less, but yeah. this is why. And guess what happens? It unifies people. It clarifies why they are there. And, and it makes people feel like they are working with or for an entity that is more than just making the almighty dollar. That's my two cents. I agree with you. And thank you. I needed to hear that. And it's for me, you know, it's actually really small things like, you know, they don't show up to the meetings that they book with me. Um, and it's just like really little things, you know, um, they ask questions. I break everything down for them and say, you can go left or right. And they go, okay, cool. I know that. But, um, but what about this other thing? And we just keep spiraling around the same things. It's like, I just, I just don't think they're taking it as seriously as I am about to take it. And I just don't like working with people who, who don't take I, things as seriously I as I do. I make a prediction. When you call and resign them and say, Hey, I just, I don't think right now that this is the right fit, but would love to stay in touch. And, you know, I wish you guys the best. And, um, you know, I really do like, let's let maybe touch base in like a year or so and see where things are at. All of a sudden they'd be like, but we were so good together. What are you talking about? You know, like all of a sudden people, when that, when the tables are turned and the situation gets flipped, all of a sudden that energy flips as well. And then the hard part is sticking to your ideals (laughs) of being like, Oh, well, you know, Susie thinks I'm cute. She hasn't been paying attention to me. Now she thinks I'm cute. Like, I guess we can be, let's get into a relationship. It's like, Nope, stick with what you said you were going to do. Oh, so good. So good. Uh, so, so second question out of the three, um, it seems that good can easily have been the enemy of the great for you, right? You mentioned like, hey, you're an executive producer and you're running this, this agency and you're doing all of this great stuff. Um, and so you could have ignored that calling. You could have ignored and not stepped into this, to this new work of you know working to overcome impossible and help the world and blend story and technology and do all of this cool stuff. You like, because what you had was good. Did it, you know, if things were bad, it would have been much easier to make the switch over to this new lane. Did you struggle with that at all? Uh, in terms of struggling from going from my production company to non impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Things were amazing. So they were better than good. They were amazing. No, we had just, we were, our focus was animation and design we just came out of doing the James Bond main title sequence for Quantum of Solace. In the world of animation and design, that's the Super Bowl. That's like the Super Bowl and the World Series and the like NBA Finals all wrapped. That's all you want to do. Like most people who know nothing about animation, if you say, oh, we did the animation kind of opening sequence for James Bond, they're like, oh yeah, I know those. It's like, it's a legacy project. We just finished that. We were like top of our game yet. This act of helping this guy by convening a bunch of brilliant people and giving him the ability to go back to doing what he was doing to me just felt so it felt amazing, 
And then watching the world respond to it, I almost felt a responsibility to be like, wow, it was that sliding door moment of like the universe, God, he, she, whatever you want to call it was like in front of you. Here you go, dude. Like there's an opportunity. What are you going to do? And then, and I, I made my decision. My decision was not to walk through the door. I decided not to. And then the universe was like, knock, knock. Here's an email from the artist. And I was like, well, shit, it looks like I got to do it now, you know? So, and then we did it and then we haven't ever looked back. You know, I want to stress again, it does not mean things have not been hard. It does not think things haven't been stressful. Just what we knew we had to do, we knew we had to do. And have you ever thought about what that decision cost you? Like what sacrifices you made? And it sounds like it was worth it, but what cost did that come with? I don't, I just don't think like that. I don't Oh no, you're not. No, like I, once I decided to do something, I do it. And yeah, I didn't get, I, I haven't been going to Cannes since that time, you know, like after, like after. We've, we've talked about awards a lot, like jokingly, we've talked about no, awards no. a lot. Are like, no, awards I, important? Cannes was just a huge party. Like to me, it was just an yeah. adult, it was just an adult boondoggle free for all. It cost <laughs> me going to that, you know, uh, but I don't care about that anymore. Like I care about the emails that I get from the people whose lives we touch that you will never read, you know, like yeah. at the end of the day, like those are the things that, that motivate us. And I think that I'm very blessed that I get to go around the world speaking about what I do at non impossible. So my award is every time I come off stage, I get, I get a bunch of people who come up and some of them are crying because they tell me the stories of the people who have Parkinson's in their family or who are deaf or who have ALS and how my story touched them. That's better than any piece of metal with my name on it in the world. Right. And that's watching and now hearing one of the big initiatives that we've launched this year is called help one help many. And that's one of our core design principles is that if I say to you, Hey, Mark, do you want to help me? solve hunger in North America, you'll be like, yeah, sure. Why that's, not? And then I say, yeah, that's, that sounds overwhelming. To me, actually. But it sounds overwhelming. <laughs> exactly. But if I say, Hey, there's a guy down the street, I know him and I get, tell you the story of this guy. And it's a story that you can relate to. And I go, Hey, Mark, you want to, I'm going to, I'm going to flash a QR code. You want to throw in five bucks. I'm going to go buy this guy dinner tonight. You're like, done. Like, Next, like, let's like, like, you don't even think about it. Help one help many is our design principle and our storytelling lens of reducing massive global issues, massive absurdities is what we call them, reducing it down to one human being that you have a chance to relate to. And we have a chance to see and just focus all of our design around solving his or her problem. And then in doing that and telling the story of that, that's what leads to other people being able to see themselves in that and seeing if they can go do that as well. Right. So for us, that's, that is, that's everything that help one help many for us is the design principle that gives us the ability to know that when we do these things, it has the potential to scale and go and help many more people. That's worth everything to us. Like that's way more important than anything that we're going to receive on the external side. And that is, yeah, that's why we do what we yeah. do. The help one help many is a really, um, it's a really cool uh, process or approach only. It's not something that I've heard or even come across until I heard it from you. But I've always struggled with the like, you know, most people are comfortable helping one person or they want to do something to help a lot of people. And I think for those of us who are influencers or visionaries or leaders or entrepreneurs or speakers or, or what have you, it's like we want to go to the masses. We want to know that what we are going to do is scalable. It has a huge impact because somehow numbers feel more important than just helping one person. I was telling my kids, we were in Jamaica uh, a week ago on a family vacation and um, the kids were like playing with like the eels and they're like picking up um, these little, I don't know what they are, these little nasty looking things. I hate nature. Uh, <laughs> and they're playing with stuff. And I told them the old, uh, the old adage of the little girl with the starfish throwing them in on the beach. Um, you know, and I understand it. I understand that like, well, the challenges are so big and everything seems so impossible and everything seems like, what is the point of putting all this time and effort into just helping one person 
if you can't go out there, it's not big enough and help the world. Um, and I bump up against that because I really just think it's ego that's getting in my way. I really just think it's like, I need to reserve my creativity and my strategy and my money and my time to making sure I'm only going to do the thing that dents the universe, Steve Jobs style. And yet, I understand what you guys do so much better because you're speaking about the artist, you know, who couldn't communicate with their brother and uncle or their dad or whatever, or, you know, with Daniel or with whatever problem it is. Like you boiled it down to one person with one problem and you brought everyone together to solve it. And you did rather than try to take on the impossible, the massive thing that's completely overwhelming that we can't wrap our minds around that we can't, really chip away at and then we try to make progress on and then never solve any problems so you never feel like you're making it anywhere so i just want to say brilliant <laughs> like, like i don't know what it, it's not a question it's just like damn i wish i learned this earlier <laughs> well now you got it now you got it um uh, look hey, let me i want to leave with this this is like the one thing that i want people if you listen to this if you don't listen to any of the bullshit i've been saying this entire time <laughs> this is the one thing i'd love for you to take away is that if you look at every single thing that surrounds us today, like if you're listening to this right now, look to the right, look to the left, look up, look down, everything, every single thing you can see or touch at one point was impossible, right? If you're sitting in a chair, there was a time people sat on the ground, then they sat on rocks then they sat on logs and their ass hurt. So they started to put like, beaver pelts and skins on top of it. So they're asked in heaven, boom, but the chair was born. Lights, like uh, technology, any of that stuff. That's all the obvious. But if every single thing that's possible today was impossible first, then that means based on history, based on basic statistics, that everything that is impossible today is on that same trajectory of going from impossible it's so possible. So with that, when you face something that is difficult, when you face something that's really, really challenging, when you really like, there's no way over, around, or under this thing, don't use the I word. Don't say impossible. Because if you do, if you say that's impossible, then you are committing the most heinous narcissistic crime in the world by saying that you are the only human in the history of our species to encounter and discover that which will remain impossible forever. That's ridiculous, right? Nobody is that special and that they're going to discover the one thing that shall that remain impossible forever. And it also, when you deny the fact that impossibility exists and you say that everything is impossible, maybe not this week, this month, this year, this decade, maybe not this lifetime, but now you just give rise to the fact that something will end at the end of the day, something will solve that something will convert it from impossible to possible. And you just see yourself as someone in that story. You see yourself as a character and a major, you can be a major character or you could be a supporting actor or actress, but you see yourself as having a role in that. And now all of a sudden it opens up your perspective of seeing things as like, all right, this is really freaking hard. This is really difficult, but it's not impossible. Now we just have to start looking. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. It might be 50 years down the line, or it might be a year down the line. It might be a week down the line, but something's there that all of a sudden gives you, empowers you It empowers your team. And it also not to get to a good And it just empowers the way that the universe responds to you because now all of a sudden they're like, the universe is like, Hey, this dude, this chick, they're not believing that we're not going to, it's not going to happen. So, all right, we might as well start to help them out. We're going to start to, help. and I swear to God, the, something unites and all of a sudden you start to see potential and you start to see possibility. So no matter where you're going, no matter what you're focusing on, no matter what you're facing, that's difficult. And that doesn't mean that life's not hard because life is really hard, right? Life is really hard sometimes, but it doesn't mean that whatever you're encountering right now, is going to remain impossible forever. It's just that you can't believe that. If you believe that there is a possibility, life will open up to you. Mic drop on that. Oh man, Mick Edling, uh, where is the best place for people to connect with you to learn more about the Not Impossible Foundation or even Not Impossible Labs? Uh, you can go to notimpossible.com. And 
And on all your various social channels, go to Not Impossible. We're really big on Friendster and MySpace, so definitely hit us up there. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You've been a ton of fun, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. 